Hi, this is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of May 11th, 2020. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.20 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify pages, also on the new Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in, in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, if it were politically achievable, how much would blocking the reverse sweep of PCE and other designated budget items really help? Second, Bert Stedman raises the possibility of borrowing from the future. But in our view, this generation already has borrowed enough. And third, the ANS Brent differential continues. What does that mean for Alaska? And now, let's join Michael. We're going to start things off this morning um, with a little bit of a dive into something that I think people don't understand, and that, of course, is this idea of the sweep and the reverse sweep and what it all means. We've talked a little bit about it. This is the various buckets of money, right, Brad, that are kind of laying around in the state treasury uh, that are, that are uh, you know, designate, not designated funds, but they're defined, uh, you know, defined funds. And they, uh, you know, they make up a big chunk of money that people have argued could be used to just fund state government because since we don't aren't allowed designated funds, we could we could use them for that. So give us first, just give us a description here of what we're talking about when we say reverse sweep and all these designated funds or dedicated funds and the difference between them and all that. Uh, under the Constitution, uh, the legislature uh, and the governor are unable to dedicate funds. They can't. They can't set aside funds and say that these funds will never be, uh, never be spent. The only dedicated fund uh, are the only dedicated funds are those established by the Constitution. The permanent fund one is one. The constitutional budget reserve uh, is a second. Um, and so every year uh, when the legislature comes toward the end of the session, there's a bunch of what are called designated funds, not dedicated, but designated funds uh, that under the Constitution, uh, uh, under the constitutional provisions regarding the Constitutional Budget Reserve are swept into, are to be swept into the Constitutional Budget Reserve uh, and held in the Constitutional Budget Reserve for uh, spending as appropriate in subsequent years, um, and included in that in that category of designated funds are the, the largest of which is the PCE fund, the Power Cost Equalization Fund. It's over a billion dollars uh, that sits in that fund. The way that the way the the legislature historically has dealt with uh, those designated funds as they come to the end of the fiscal year is to, is in the appropriations bill to provide. That, that those funds uh, will be swept uh, under the Constitution uh, at, the end of the, at the end of the fiscal year as is required um, at one second to midnight, and then one second after midnight on July 1st, which is the beginning of the fiscal year, uh, they, they are reswept uh, back into their designated accounts and continue on as, as designated funds. It's the workaround the legislature's come to uh, to deal with the ability to, to deal with designating those funds, um, setting those funds aside and, and, and avoid them being swept in the constitutional budget reserve. A couple of years ago, uh, Governor Dunleavy um, uh, proposed uh, not to sweep those funds back or, 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 or redesignated um, uh, some funds that historically hadn't been subject to being swept, uh, uh, to, 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 to being subject to sweep. And then the, the minority, the House minority, 
um, held out and said they weren't going to agree to uh, the resweep, uh, the sweep of those funds back into uh, the designated funds uh, as a way of un until they until the majority agreed to the the permanent fund dividend, the right? Permanent, uh, a full payment of the permanent fund dividend, and that got to be uh, in a standoff. And and the and the issue of these the, of the sweep and the resweep. Um, has has been an issue since uh, being raised then, and several think uh, we had this at the end of last week's show. Tuckerman was raising the issue uh, about uh, about using those funds to to stem the budget gap. Uh, several have have argued that those funds ought to be shouldn't be should be used uh, made a part of the of the of the uh, 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 general fund and then used to help close the budget gap in in subsequent years. And of course, these there's a, there's a lot of money in there. I mean, the PCE alone has a billion dollars in it. The Higher Education Endowment Fund has four four hundred something million. There's a variety of accounts out there, a variety of buckets. I remember Tammy Wilson saying at one point she her office had figured that there's somewhere near two billion dollars in various accounts out there, just um, you know, uh, you know, the whole time. So uh, th those monies could be used for something. Yeah, the largest, the lar well, they've been designated to be for something. The largest of that of those is the PCE fund. It's around a billion one uh, will be uh, uh, at the end of this uh, fiscal year. Uh, the Alaska Higher Education Investment Fund, which was set up during Governor Parnell's uh, era as a as an investment fund to spin off earnings that were then used to, to fund college scholarships for Alaska seniors, uh, has about three hundred and fifty billion or three hundred fifty million in it. Uh, the major funds total up to about 1.5 billion, and by the time you add all of the other little designated funds that are caught up in this process, you you may be upwards of two billion. But you're not you're you're not north of two billion. There's not an unlimited amount of funds. It's not like it's not like the permanent fund uh, uh, or or any of the other constitutional funds. Uh, it is uh, it's a it's a, 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 a about a billion half to two billion dollars. So the argument has been we could take these monies and utilize them as a stopgap, <clears throat> at least in the short term, to help offset this, um, you know, this this looming fiscal crisis now with oil prices and tourism and COVID and all this other stuff. Um, what say you? Well, here's the problem, Michael. Y yes, potentially we could do that. I mean, the legislature, uh, there are there are significant protectors of those designated funds in the legislature, Lyman Hoffman being the big one, uh, protecting the PCE fund, which is sort of his baby, um, because it, it's used to, 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 to equalize power costs in the bush, to, to set up basically at the time uh, oil money was at its height. Uh, and it was it, the the argument was the urban areas are getting the benefit of lower energy prices. Um, uh, that there, there ought to be some equalization out in the bush, and so the power cost equalization fund sits there, generating earnings that are then used to equalize costs from the bush uh, back to the uh, toward uh, what the urban area uh, energy costs are. There are protectors of those funds, so it has not been politically achievable. Uh, uh, to 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 you know block the reverse sweep uh, and and to keep those funds in the general fund. Uh, the political forces have been such that uh, been so, that such that they've kept those funds uh, uh, in the designated areas. This idea that we don't have we can't have dedicated funds in the state, mm -hmm. and uh, and and they've gotten around that. This is this really is kind of more of a political manipulation of that than anything else. These designated funds. And this idea of the sweep and the reverse sweep, and it literally uh, is the, is the brainchild of some folks who wanted to be able to do exactly what the Constitution is trying to preclude, and this is their way around that. Um, and there's some pretty powerful people, as you mentioned, Lyman Hoffman with the power uh, power cost equalization fund. I mean, they have squirreled away hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars into these accounts, and it gives them a lot of political clout and power to be able to do things. Oh sure, I mean Lyman is well known in the bush for having for, for having established the PCE and protected the PCE uh, all these years and having built up the PCE uh, all these years and and you know Sean still gets credit for creating the higher education uh, uh, fund uh, and 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 they want those legacies. Those are legacy funds for them that 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 they think achieve good purposes and. And uh, and and certainly are are for that purpose, and uh, you know, and and they're very protective of it. 
uh, the college, the university uh, system is also protective of, of the higher education funds because it's really a way of helping to subsidize uh, the university system in the state. So it, they've, they've, you know, they've, they've created their own constituencies and, and people try to protect them. And, uh, you know, that, and again, these, but these monies, and we've talked about this in the past with other folks that, you know, these monies sitting out there really was not the intent of, uh, I would say the framers of the Constitution. That's why they they very clearly said that there couldn't be any dedicated funds. Um, they didn't want this. They wanted to, you know, I think to, to borrow Donna Arduin's phrase, they wanted all money to be green, so to speak. Yeah, technically, I mean, what Hyman, what Lyman would say if he were on the program right now, is is technically they are reappropriated every year. Um, that's what that's what the reverse sweep does. It reappropriates them back into these accounts. So so they would say that it's not violating the Constitution. They would say it's just a it's just a continuing. It's a decision by each legislature uh, to continue the the designation to continue the set aside of these programs that that it has been consistent with. Uh, with uh, with with the actions of previous legislatures, so they they would they would they would cringe at the argument that it's unconstitutional or not consistent with constitutional intent because of these annual appropriations. Right, but then again, then you lead that leads us back upstream to another problem, which of course is the binding caucus, which this has always been contingent in binding caucuses that you vote for the reverse sweep as a procedural vote. And so, I mean, this is layers upon layers of problems that are kind of feeding into each other. Am I wrong? No, you're you're right. I mean, it's it is. They are looking out for. Uh, they're looking out for their interests, their programs. I mean, that's part of it's part of the situation we've got in the legislature. We've got sixty legislators, each of which has a program or a a handful of programs that they're going to protect to the death. And and one of the ways they do that is through the log rolling of you protect my programs, I'll protect your programs. And and we don't have a legislature that comes in. Uh, every year and looks at things clean and fresh and says, okay, how are we going to deal with our problems this year? We have we have a legislature that has a lot of history uh, and passes on a lot of history from uh, from from previous times and and protects things. But but that's a problem all, all over the place. I mean, we've got the same yeah. thing with the uh, with the uh, 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 the Arts Council. I mean, we got right. people who are protecting the Arts Council. Yeah, that's the thing. Protecting their little bailiwick, their little corner of the world. And that's where we've, uh, and that's where, that's how we've gotten to where we're got. You know, we've got all these people protecting their little special program. Uh, that's how we ended up here. We were talking about the uh, PCE, the reverse sweep, all these various funds that are out there, and the fact that they total up to 1.5, maybe closer to two billion. But it's not enough, Brad. I mean, is that the long and the short of it here? I mean, the the, the bottom line is, sure, it's a stopgap for maybe part of one year. But for the next 10 years, that deficit is going to be even larger. I mean, when, when we look and we've been over this in previous episodes, when when you look at at the at the 10 year plan um, uh, out there right now and factor in uh, the revenues, uh, the drop in revenues as a result of the drop in oil prices um, and and even looking at uh restructuring the PFD into POMV 50-50, splitting the, the POMV draw 50-50 between government uh, and uh, 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 citizens, which is a restructuring of the, of the current PFD, current statutory PFD. We're running uh, uh, and, and holding spending at what many claim they want to do, which is current levels plus uh, uh, adjusted for inflation. That's the, that's the spending cap. Uh, that people talk about when uh, people in the legislature at least talk about when they talk about spending caps, uh, they, they, you, have a, you, you have a huge gap uh, in, uh, uh, in in the budget that goes on uh, forever. Uh, we have revenues. Look at FY21. Uh, we have revenues, and this is the spring forecast. We have revenues of about 2.7 billion dollars. Uh, we have spending of 2.6 billion dollars. Uh, that's a 1.9 billion dollar uh, gap. Uh, and that gap continues every year grows uh, in some years, continues every year for for the the full extent of the ten year uh, of the ten year uh, ten year outlook over the course of the ten years, it's about fifteen billion dollars of of gap that we have. And so the PCE uh, the, the 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 reverse sweep funds 
yeah, you can, you can, let's just say that we overcome all of the political opposition um, and we, uh, and we're able to use those reverse sweep funds, throw them into the general fund uh, and, and treat them like another savings account or treat them like another revenue stream uh, that closes the gap for maybe a year out of, out of the next 10. Uh, it, it's, it, it is when viewed in the context of how we ought to view these things, which is, which is the 10 year outlook, it's a drop in the bucket uh, of, of closing the gap. So, you know, every, it, when people bring up the reverse sweep, yeah, okay, let's, let's sweep them. Let's, let's sweep them all. Let's not have any reverse sweep. Let's throw them all into the budget. Um, yep. we got a year. Now what? <laughs> right. <laughs> we, right. We, we've solved the problem. We've solved the problem for you know, part of the problem uh, for, for maybe a year. Uh, we've closed down all these programs. We've closed down PCE. We're now throwing the Bush uh, energy supply into much higher prices fed by, fed by diesel uh, and, uh, and, and other uh, uh, things that they use for energy out in the Bush. Uh, we, we've thrown that out the window. We've thrown the, the, uh, the higher ed uh, 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 scholarship fund out the window. Uh, those programs are gone. We've closed a year of the gap. Now what? Uh, and 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 so it's not. It's, this is just. You can't view this as a one-year issue. If you view this as a one-year issue, uh, you get through that year, and then and then the problem's even bigger in the in the following years. We've got to view this uh, over the context of of you know this is the life we've got now. We've got reboot reduced revenue from oil. Uh, uh, we've got uh, we've got some earnings from uh, from the, uh, uh, the the permanent fund, but if you want to keep the PFD, those earnings uh, are only you know limited. They're limited in in how they and how much they can do to to close the close the window. Some people say, okay, we'll just cut our way to the rest of it. Well, you're talking about uh, a 50 percent budget cut in one year. I mean, let's let's say we use PCE, uh, we use the reverse sweep funds. Uh, to close the budget cut uh, budget next year. Okay, well, okay, so we got it. We got it closed for that year. Now you got a 50% budget cut in in the next year and in every year thereafter. And and we saw at the beginning of the Dunleavy administration that's just not going to happen. So it, it's it's great to talk about reverse sweep. It's great to throw it up in the middle of a conversation, but it's not a solution. It's not the long term solution that uh, that uh, that resolves the issues. Brad Keithley is our guest, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Um, and of course, we've talked about Brad that even the cutting of the PFD down to nothing would also, I mean, again, it doesn't, it's not enough to fill this gap, um, uh, for, for any length of time. There's just not enough money left in the system to be able to promote this. I mean, we're running deficits, even if they take pretty much a full PFD, we're still running a few hundred million dollar deficits that has to be taken from somewhere. Yeah, exactly right, Michael. And, and, and. And and cutting the PFD, eliminating the PFD, one more time, or or you know the first of, of zillions more times, is a tax, a tax on middle and lower income Alaska families, a tax that has the largest adverse impact on the overall Alaska economy because it's only on Alaskans. It's not drawing in any fund any funds from from non residents, um, and it is a tax on. On middle and lower, it is it is an inequitable tax because it's a tax on middle and lower income Alaska families. So yes, we're not closing it, and to the extent we are closing it by eliminating the PFD, we're closing it in the way that has the largest adverse impact. Not my words, ICER's words. Largest adverse impact on the overall Alaska economy uh, and on Alaska uh, Alaska families. So we're making the situation worse. Uh, by closing it uh, in that fashion. Kelly says, what expenditures could we cut? Oh, do you, how much time do you have, Kelly? There's uh, there's plenty of expenditures that could be cut, but I think with what Brad is saying is that we could not cut our way all the way down to where we need to be because we literally at this point would have to cut 50% of government out uh, at any one time. And we've already seen how well that played out for Governor Dunleavy in the last go-round when he wanted to, it was a fractional cut comparatively. Uh, to be able to do it. There's just not the political will to make it happen. And now we're jumping back to number two, which was this idea of drawing more money out of the ERA. Uh, Bert Stedman had an article, or was quoted in an article, uh, that talks about uh, drawing out of the ERA, but he will only do it under certain conditions, he says, including a plan to repay that. Uh, Brad, let's talk about it. So the the 
issue that most most people I'm I'm sure are familiar with, but the issue is basically this: we Bert has been in, Bert has been among the most insistent on limiting draws from the ERA to the legislature's approximation of the long-term real rate of return uh, on the permanent fund assets. Um, and that's set at 5.25 for, I think, one more fiscal year, and then it, and then it drops down uh, uh, to, to 5%. Um, and and Bert's uh, uh, concern, which frankly I share, is that overdrawing the ERA, uh, overdrawing that long-term uh, real rate of return, is essentially eating the seed corn. It is it is eating into the investment base of the permanent fund, and what you're really doing is reducing uh, the permanent fund earnings in future years because you've reduced the investment base. Your investment base, you're reducing the the permanent fund earnings um, in future years, and and you're really taxing future generations by reducing their share of the earnings. You're taxing future generations just to make uh, this generation's life better. Bert has been in in statements that that I've seen in the legislature and in statements I've seen Bert quoted in the in the press. Bert's been very resistant to um, uh, taking more than uh, the the POMV share, the 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 five percent share uh, from uh, from the ERA uh, in any given year because of this concern about impact on future generations. In this article in Route 50. Um, and and it's a we, we've got it up on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets uh, Facebook page if people want to uh, want to find a link to it. In this article on Route 50, for the first time, I've seen Burke quoted as as saying something a little bit different than what he said. Uh, and here's the quote: Stedman said that while pulling more money from the permanent fund to deal with the current financial crunch may seem like the easiest path forward, it could shortchange future generations. He said he'd want to see a plan that would force the state to pay this cash back. So essentially, for the first time that I've seen Bert say this, essentially he would he is saying that that he might be agreeable to uh, an excess PFP, uh, ERA draw, uh, but treating it as a loan uh, from the future from future generations to the current generation, uh, and and that the current generation uh, there would be some plan for for paying it back. Here, here's my problem with that. We, we, we've been to this movie before. Uh, the CBR, draws from the CBR are exactly that. They're draws from a savings account that under the Constitution uh, are to be paid back uh, at some point. One of the problems with the constitutional provision is it doesn't say over what period, and it doesn't provide for interest. And so there's really, there's very little discipline on on making those Paybacks occur. The timing of those paybacks occur, but it's clear under the Constitution that the amount uh, is to be is to be paid back, and and we have not seen. We started drawing down the CBR. Well, we started drawing down the SBR, the statutory budget reserve, our first line of defense, um, in 2013. We 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 drew it down for a couple of years, and then we started drawing uh, on the CBR, our second line of defense. And over the last eight years, uh, between the SBR and the CBR combined, we've drawn down $17 billion, nearly $18 billion. Um, uh, at the end, of, it, at the, end of, of the current fiscal year, it may be over $18 billion. We've drawn down $18 billion, over about $13 billion, upwards of $13 billion has come from the CBR. We haven't paid a dime of that back. In addition to that, uh, we have underfunded uh, PERS and TERS, the, the pension obligations. Um, uh, we haven't paid uh, the the share of PERS and TERS uh, that this generation ought to be ought to be paying. We've essentially shoved a portion of the PERS and TERS, the the pension obligations to state employees and teachers. We've shoved a portion of that into the future. That essentially is also borrowing from the future because because we're underpaying it today. We're not paying this generation's share. We're shoving it to future generations and leaving it to future generations to pay increased amounts above what they otherwise would, uh, because this this uh, this generation has has underpaid and this generation hasn't really paid dime one uh, on that underfunded amount at least since at least since 2014 uh, um, as well. The combined amount that we've borrowed. Uh, from that this generation's already borrowed from future generations um, is about uh, between between the CBR 
um, and and the uh, and Persian Tours uh, is about twenty billion dollars, something between nineteen and and, and twenty billion dollars. Um, and that's I mean that's that's sort of day one. And when you when you look at that on a uh, on a per Alaskan basis, sometimes it's better to do these things on a per Alaskan basis. Uh, that is uh, in the neighborhood of twenty six thousand dollars per Alaska man, woman, and child that this generation has already borrowed uh, from future generations. And we have we're, we're not paying that down. It's going up. I mean, the amount of draw from the CBR is is going up until until we exhaust it. Um, and that's twenty six thousand dollars per Alaska per per seven hundred thousand people per Alaska man, woman, and child that this generation has bought, has has borrowed from future generations. So when when we talk about borrowing now, when Bert talks about borrowing now from future generations um, uh, by by having excess P, PFD draw or excess ERA draws, and 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 saying that we're going to pay it back at some point. You know, frankly, Michael, I just don't have a lot of faith in that. We, we've been, we've, we've seen this movie. We've been down this road. We aren't making progress uh, uh, in terms of this generation standing up and paying its own share. Not only standing up and paying its own share, but paying future generations back for what we've already borrowed. And so, it, 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 it's something that Bert's tossed out. I think it's something that that people ought to consider. But uh, but more borrowing, I don't from future generations. I don't think is a solution to the current generation's problem. This generation needs to pay its own way, and once it's forced to do so, uh, equitably, all Alaska families have to pay a share. I think we bring spending down because people say, "Well, shit, I can't afford that," um, and I'm ready to bring spending down. Until Alaskans have to confront the actual cost of government that they're generating, I don't think I don't think we'll see the motivation to bring spending down. But if we have that, if we had Alaskans having to pay the actual cost of government, I think they would bring. I think there'd be a, a broad scale movement to bring spending down. Bert's proposed solution or a possible solution of just borrowing more from the future just makes that situation worse. It doesn't make it any better. Well, and bringing up the fact that they haven't paid anything back and they don't even have a plan for paying anything back, including the things in the CBR, I think is encapsulated in another quote in this article from Repre uh, Representative Ivy Sponholtz, who basically said, Alaska's been struggling financially over the last five or six years because of low oil prices and declining production. We've already cut our budget by 40% in the last five years. Years. This means no capital budgets. This means additional layoffs and cuts and yada, yada. But again, <clears throat> this kind of political manipulation of we've cut the budget over 40 percent in the last five years, which, you know, it's cuts to the increase. I mean, Shelley Hughes has gone into great detail on how that 40 percent number is just bogus. But this is how they want to try and, and, and frame this. They want to frame it as, oh, we've already done all the cuts we could possibly do. We, we need to do these things. Um, you know, and we're just now discovering that we have a financial crisis kind of thing. Yeah, and 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 not only have have the cuts been bogus, but we've covered we've covered we've covered spending through through borrowing. I mean, we we haven't covered spending through personal responsibility through paying this generation paying its own way uh, for government. We've covered it through borrowing by by draining savings savings that under the CBR is, under the Constitution is supposed to be filled back in there for future generations, so that when they hit their crises and they will, that they have the same sort of cushion that that this generation has had. Uh, we've done it by draining savings, draining something that we're supposed to pass on to future generations, and we've done it by underfunding. PERS and TERS uh, uh, in order to shift costs from this generation to future generations. It, it's time to draw the line. It's time to say, man up to this generation, man up, pay your own way. Once you confront how much that is, then, then you're going to see it and you're going to bring spending down. But until we man up and do it, uh, I just don't think, I, I think we're going to continue to have People like Ivy and others who say, "Oh no, we need to continue spending, and we'll just keep borrowing from from the future. We'll just keep borrowing from future generations, making their lives worse, so ours can be ours can be artificially better. Uh, we'll just we'll just keep doing that." I I, I think I, I mean it, it's important to note what Bert has said here. It's important to note that he's raised he's raised this possibility, but I think it's just a, it's a continuation of a failed policy that we've had since 2013. 
and and I think it's time that we that we just confront what we're what we're doing to ourselves uh, and what we're doing to future generations. And as I say, this generation to man up. And what you're essentially arguing is the same thing that uh, Jay Hammond argued, right? I mean, Jay Hammond argued about the income tax uh, at the state level, saying that that was really the two things that keep people that kept people connected to the spending of government was the income tax and the permanent fund. And after we've lost both of those things, people are completely disconnected at this point. That would be the only thing that would make them uh, aware, I guess, of the skin in the game. I mean, you know, the, that that's the only way that they would really, truly understand the cost of their government. They're kind of all blasé. Okay, fine, whatever. I mean, the money's there. Just go ahead and do it. Not realizing that they were overspending. Many people not understanding that we drained the savings accounts dry. This is esoterica that a lot of people just don't understand. But this would put that put this directly back into people's laps and in their pockets and they would feel it directly and there would be a a, a, a kind of a tax revolt at some point people would see the bill and go whoa 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 wait a second yeah exa- exactly right i i mean i p- people accuse me of wanting an income tax i don't want an income tax but i want i want this generation to confront what it's spending i want this generation to face up to 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 what it's doing uh, by by relying on savings to future generations, but I want this fa- generation to face up to what it's spending, and and the and the way to do that equitably, the way to get everybody to face up to it, is through, in my view, a flat tax. But but is is to is to force people to pay a tax, force people to pay for government. Once they do that, once they see the cost of government, once they see have to confront themselves, uh, how much is being spent. I do think. That there's a pushback. Part of the problem now with using, and, we, and we've discussed this before, but part of the problem with using the PFD, PFD cuts to fund government, is the top 20% isn't seeing that. The, 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 PF, the PFD is a very small portion of their income. They say, yeah, give it up. I don't care. I don't, I don't, you know, I use it to, you know, to, to pay for dinner on my trip to Hawaii every year. Um, they're, they, they're not seeing the, the, the reality of it. Middle and lower income Alaska families who are revolting against spending, there's the, they're the ones that are driving the revolt against spending, are seeing the impact uh, of, of, of PFD cuts uh, and the tax effect of PFD cuts. We need to get that across the board so that all Alaska families see it. And once they do, once the top 20% sees it, um, I, I, <laughs> Natasha Imhoff, von Imhoff is going to change. She's not going to say, yeah, yeah, okay, let's keep state funding, state funding to the Arts Council. Let's keep three university system. She's going to say, wait a second, you want to tax my income by that amount? No, we're bringing, we're bringing spending down. That's what we need to do. Continuing to find ways to push it off on future generations is just making the problem worse. Uh, it's just it's just providing yet another band aid that's going to have to be paid for by future generations. Another another charge on the credit card that's going to have to be paid for by future generations. This generation needs to face face up to what it's doing. Um, Brad, we're running out of time here. So final thoughts, what, what are people need to be doing and paying attention? Uh, because I think a lot of people argue, well, but if, if we have an income tax, we'll lose the PFD because people are not going to want to have a PFD if there is an income tax because they see it as some kind of transfer, uh, of wealth. What, you know, what, what, what do we need to do in your mind here? I got about a minute and a half. Well, we need to, we need to understand that the PFD, the PFD cuts are an income tax. They are a tax on the income that's going to Alaska families. And it's a tax, it's a tax rate that falls hardest on middle and lower income Alaska families. I'm not arguing for adding a tax. We're, we already have a tax. We already have an income tax on PFD income. We need to change the structure of the existing tax so that all Alaska families are paying the tax and all Alaska families have the same skin in the game and the same incentive uh, to be- push for reduced spending. It's a falsehood that the top 20% is using that, hey, we don't have any taxes now, and boy, I'm against I'm against additional taxes. PFD cuts are an income tax. And, and, and the sooner we wake up to that, the sooner Alaskans think about it in those terms, and that it's an unfair income tax pushed on low, uh, middle and lower income Alaska families, an income tax that, that, that is the worst approach for the overall Alaska economy. The sooner we think about Having a better income tax, a fairer income tax, a more equitable income tax, a more evenly spread income tax, 
frankly, the faster we're going to get to spending cuts, because once you force the, the top 20 percent to face up to the fact that they're being taxed like everybody else, they're going to push for spending cuts and, and we're going to be able to bring spending down. But let's jump all the way up to number three, Brad. We'll skip around a little bit here since we have about five minutes here in the break. Uh, and you want to give us an update on uh, Alaska North Slope oil, the prices. Um, is it closing the gap with Brent? I mean, now that it's been disconnected from its historical tie to Brent, what's happening there? And uh, where do uh, where do the oil markets and the experts think things are going to play out? Well, one of the things we've talked about on the last few shows, Michael, is the is the disconnect of the ANS price from Brent, and it's and it's been a huge disconnect. Not not only have oil prices generally been depressed from where they were. Uh, I mean, we were in the $60, $70 range uh, as late as uh, January, uh, and now we're now we're down in the uh, the twenty dollar range, uh, maybe a thirty dollar range, depending upon depending upon the day. Not not only have oil prices uh, fallen hard, but A and S for those who've been on the who followed the program for the last couple of weeks, A and S Alaska North Slope crude has fallen much further uh, than uh, uh, than Brent has. Uh, historically, A and S has been tied to Brent very closely to Brent, uh, but in uh, March and April, it became disconnected. The average uh, price for Brent in in April was twenty seven dollars. The average price for ANS uh, in April was sixteen dollars. Um, May has 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 continued uh, a differential, a substantial differential between the two. In the last couple of days, uh, it's closed a little bit. ANS has gone up. While uh, while Brent has gone down and there's been some closing of it, but the May average and we're only in the 11th day of, of May, but the May average for Brent uh, thus far is $29. The May average for ANS is $19. The significance of 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 this of this differential uh, is is if it continues for an extended period of time. Uh, the 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 revenue forecast that the state uses, uh, the budget that the that the the revenue that the state uses for for budgeting purposes, is really based upon uh, a Brent price uh, with some small differential uh, between A and S and Brent, but it assumes the continuation of the relationship between Brent and uh, and A and S we've had historically, and if and and while Brent seems to be climbing back closer to that thirty three dollar. Uh, price that uh, the, the Department of Revenue forecast for uh, FY21 for the upcoming uh, fiscal year, why it seems to be climbing back closer to that $33 level uh, because of the much lower, because of that, because of the disconnect between ANS and Brent, uh, ANS is operating at a much lower level than, uh, than the $33. Um, if, you, if you assume uh, the, the Brent price right now averages out at about 32 by the end of the year, if you look at the futures futures market if that if this differential continues ans will average out at about twenty two dollars and 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 even the the revenue forecast of a of a billion and a half deficit or a billion seven deficit uh that people have made uh just will grow exponentially and will be will be over two billion dollars in deficit so that's the significant of it the 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 differential is closing uh, as I say, over the last couple of days, and maybe the West Coast market is getting back in some sort of order, uh, but but it certainly hasn't closed yet. Uh, and while the gap is closing some, there's still a huge gap there. Um, and and I, as I said in last week's show, I have a concern that that we that we're seeing a structural change somehow in the West Coast market, even if it's a change that's tied only to. The, the COVID shutdown, uh, it's the shutdown in California that's important. It's not what's going on in Alaska. We're, we, we barely register as a, as a smidgen on the, on the West Coast market. Right. Uh, it's what's going on in California and Washington State that really drives it. So even if, even if we're seeing some, uh, even, even if that's the reason for the gap, uh, if, this, if, if, 
if the shutdown in California and Washington extends for an extended period, um, uh, this gap may extend for extended period, and we may see even additional revenue problems in the state above what we forecast already. And we look back, and your chart here is up on the screen right now, your Sunday chart, looking at this. And we could see, again, July, August, September, October, November of last year, it's always been a $1 to $3 difference, $3 at most, between them. Sometimes ANS actually posting higher than Brent. And uh, you care to bet money on whether or not this actually aligns again, or is this the new normal? I... I, 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 I'm not going to I'm not going to put down chips on 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 that issue right now. It's there there are arguments to be made for why this will normalize uh, once uh, uh, gasoline demand in California jet and, and jet fuel demand in California picks back up. There's arguments to be made why it will normalize. There's also arguments to be made why it won't normalize. Why we've seen uh, a fundamental disconnect of ANS and and ANS going into a micro market that looks more like. Uh, West Texas crude or looks more like a uh, Canadian crude uh, than it does like a world crude. So I, it, it, we, this is one we're going to have to wait out. But every day we go with that, with that differential is a day that we're falling short uh, of, uh, of the revenue projections that, uh, that we've used to, to make our budget. And of course that means that we may need to change the way that we're budgeting moving forward. I mean, is this, are you seeing anything on that? About 20 seconds here. Well, yeah. I mean, it, if if we've got a price disconnect, we're gonna have to we're gonna have to reassess how we do uh, how we do the 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 pr projections of uh, of oil prices in the state, and it won't be to the better. It will be to the it will be to the south, uh, and uh, and that's just gonna open up the budget gap that we that we talked about in the first segment. We'll talk about in the next segment. It's just gonna open it up even more. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Brad, thank you for sticking with us uh, throughout the second hour today. I appreciate it. Appreciate your patience on that. And uh, thanks for coming on board and sharing all this great news with us. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the Weekly Top 3 from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.